Stop. What? Don't you say that. I was about to ask you that exact <laughs> question. I mean, you you made me laugh. You tweeted, you saying, what does it all mean? I might have to watch the first season again and again and then ask you lot to explain it to yeah. me. It's, uh, I do actually understand what it is because I've seen it multiple times, but it is one of those stories that is not only brilliant to watch but completely impossible to explain. And if I try, I'll ruin it. Mm. So that's the end of the interview. Well, the gist <laughs> is... <laughs> you well, can do, to see you. you can, yeah, thank you so much for coming in. It's, um, <laughs> the, the, gist, the gist is that Prairie Johnson, who is the, the OA... Um, has I'm reading this, Philip. Missing, missing. <laughs> um, yeah, only the names. Okay. So, but missing for seven years. When she when she went, when she when she disappeared, she was blind. Yeah. Um, and then seven years later, miraculously, she comes back. She has restored sight. And she gathers a bunch of misfits together. She won't tell anyone what's going on. She won't tell the FBI. She gathers. This is part one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is already online. Been there for a while. Um, she gathers a bunch of misfits together in a loft. And she started to tell them this story. Was it true? Was it not true? You're never quite sure. The story she tells is remarkable about being held in a basement by a scientist who is trying to cure death. Which is you. Conducting some strange experiments. And increasingly, these kind of misfits tend to believe her, but her story becomes more and more outrageous and the things she's asking them to do to jump dimensions seem uh, questionable and maybe she's just mentally ill. Mm. Uh, and then, I don't even know how I shouldn't describe it. I'll tell you this about it. Uh, that it's one of the most binge shows on Netflix, and I don't mean more people watch it than others, mm. there are many popular shows. I mean, when people start watching it, they can't stop. And mm. so many people watched all eight hours from beginning to end and then really? got sick the next day. We're responsible for a terrible drop in productivity all over the world. Uh, and because it's made by these indie filmmakers who have never made television before, it's completely original. They're kind of unspoilt by being yeah. the kind of hack that I am. And, uh, and the success of the first season instead of, like most people, doubling down and regurgitating, they've taken that as a cue to really let their imaginations go absolutely bonkers. And, and the other thing is, even at the end of season one, and don't worry, I'm not going to give anything away, any spoilers, but even when people have watched it, they're still questioning it. Oh, there are questions. It. I mean, they're still going, well, actually, and people are forming their own opinions yeah. of what's actually well, happening see, and what's going right. to happen. I'm asked all the time in the stream, I and mean, all over the world people come up and want to talk about it, but here's the thing, most television shows are made, you put something on, if people like it, everyone goes, oh, thank God for that. Let's try and make some more and let's try and extend it. They sat down for two years before they tried to sell it and they mapped out five seasons of this extraordinary spiritual thriller mystery. Well, uh, for you as a character, as you, I mean, you've done very well here and you always do very well uh, keeping things secret. Um, but you did actually... I just don't uh, want to spoil it for you. Yeah, of course. But it's got to be tough. I mean, it, that, the, not only that, but, I mean, you've got uh, Star Trek Discovery. Mm. You know, uh, we don't know whether he's going to come back. It's kind of an oddly parallel yeah. universe. Yeah. You know, it must be in the ether. You were, uh, as, as, as Lucian Malfoy, you had to keep, he had to keep that relative. Well, I know it, had been, it was in a so book, but nevertheless... That's the thing, that we, a new Harry Potter film would come along, and I'd always sign them as Mickey Mouse or John Lennon and go, you do realise the book's on sale, don't you? I don't yeah. know why we had to keep those things a secret. Everyone knew the story. But with these things, they are entirely... This is an entirely original story. And uh, it's mind-blowingly original. I mean, I don't... They didn't have to sell it because they'd written all the scripts. Yeah. If they'd had to pitch this, I'm not sure anyone would have bought it because it's so unusual. Uh, but now it's on and it's popular. They're given licence to do their own thing in their own way. And you, uh, to get the role, was it a phone call sort of in the middle of the night? Yeah, there's a weird thing. They did start shooting with somebody else. Uh, it didn't work out, thank God, because it's one of the most interesting parts I've ever played. <laughs> I got a phone call in the middle of the night saying, we're sending you eight scripts, read them now. And I went, well, I'm just going to bed. And they went, well, you're Skyping the director at two o'clock in the morning. And I went, I, I really don't want to. Can I do this tomorrow? And they went, no, because if you like it and he likes you, you have to get on a plane at breakfast. And I read these eight things and I was, my head was spinning. I'd never read anything like them. I Skyped the guy. By the time my kids came down for breakfast, I was packed. Oh, my I gosh. Flew to New York. I got off the plane and I went straight to Grand Central Station and shot my first scene. Yeah, it was. Wow, it was, it was that's a very good sign. What, what's what's interesting about what, what's happening with the, the way we watch uh, movies and TV and drama now is that um, you're saying quite obviously you've fallen madly in love with this, as have uh, you know this it's army of fans. There's nothing worse than that to say he's a fan, but I'm a huge fan of this. Show. Which is which is great. fantastic. Yeah, and so um, let's be honest, so that's okay. Steven Spielberg said that um, that Netflix movies shouldn't be at the Academy yeah. Awards. Um, what do you think about that? I'm not really in the business of making an enemy of Steven Spielberg. Um, I do think we all watch things differently now. So he, what he's trying to do, I think, and I'll put words in his mouth, is make sure that the cinema experience still exists for people mm. because there's nothing more magic than sitting in a big dark room with hundreds of people and watching a story unfold. We've done it since the beginning of time, gathered in groups to tell stories. And I think we do it 
because there's a connection between you and the other people in the dark room. When yeah. you see a piece of truth of human behaviour unfolded, you suddenly feel less alone. Uh, but what Netflix has done is revolutionised and disrupted the whole industry. And uh, you can tell stories, like with Star Trek, you can tell single stories, there's no adverts, you can watch it all from beginning to end. And one of the reasons it's odd to talk about the OA is there may be people out there, fools that they are, who haven't seen the first season yet. So, unlike with most TV, you can't talk about it because it's been and gone. Mm. Uh, there are people yet to discover it. And are they uh, planning to take it all the way to the fifth series? Well, that it's, obviously even... it's up to how many people watch and whether Netflix yeah. like it or not. I hope they do. I've heard their ideas for subsequent series. Each series is a different bunch of genres. This one's much more of a film noir. It's got a private detective in it, but they subvert the genre completely. They've got some fabulous, bonkers and uh, mind-blowing ideas for future seasons. I hope we get to make them, but it, you know, it will depend on the This Morning audience tuning in. Right, it's all down all to you, down so to you know we've got to much. do. Uh, my children fed. <laughs> <laughs> the OA Series 2 is on Netflix from the 22nd of March, but as you just said, Season 1 is out there now. But the most devour. important thing for people to remember is do not put your head next to a tiger and make noises. Right. Just it's insane! <laughs> it's chuffing madness, that's what it oh, is. Oh, God. There's the noise, there's the noise. There's the noise. <laughs> well, you, didn't you chuff with a fox? Uh, I did have a fox come into my front room the other day. I was terrified. I don't know what to say. So you didn't, actually, you didn't actually put your head next to it and chuff with it. Though. I went up to it. I was banging on the ground. And it wouldn't noise. It? Just stared this at me. Fo- it's a in silver fox. Room. Yeah. Okay. It's it, an actual it, silver fox, Phil. I, uh, it, w- it wouldn't leave, and I was. I got. A, I went and got a golf club. And started banging on the floor, and then I changed it because it was a seven iron. I didn't want to ruin the set. I got the putter. <laughs> That's not, that's not the stuffing of your sofa there, is it? That's no, it's the not, no, it just stared at me completely unperturbed by me. Wow. Yeah, wow. Then I went outside that window, banged on the window, and it turned around and ran back into the garden. Oh, but it wow. was scary. OK, all right, you see? Um, but you're right, you're right. I wouldn't go anywhere near a tiger inside or outside a cage. No. I'd put my head no. up to it and go... <laughs> yeah. No, because if, the, if your viewers are all doing it now, there'll be a whole bunch of lawsuits. I want nothing to do. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, much indeed.